I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Dr. Namrata Goswami, an independent scholar on international relations, faculty with the Thunderbird School of Global Management, Arizona State University, and co-author of the book Scramble for the Skies. She joins us today to discuss the current state of the emerging space economy and the great powers competition for control of Earth orbit and beyond. So Namrata, welcome back. I am so honored and excited to have you with me today because it has been, I mean, 2023 was a tremendous year for space and we haven't talked in quite a while. Oh yeah, it's been it's been a very exciting year for space and happy new year and what a pleasure to be back again on your podcast. Well, thank you. Thank you. So, I want to get right into last year's launch numbers. For the third year in a row, new world records were set for both orbital launch attempts, uh, 222 of those, and successful orbital launches, there were 210 in a single year. That makes 2023 pretty historic, and this is building and growing year after year. So this leads me to ask whether you think 2024 will match or potentially even exceed that as the space industry grows. Yeah, so from what we are seeing in terms of launch schedules, not just for the U.S., but across the world, I would think that 2024 looks pretty exciting and might exceed 2023 because nations are looking to prove their launch capability, showcase how much they can launch, and also that they are pushing for their commercial sector to launch, right? So just uh, in this last few days in the new year, we had India launch, we have China's uh, Orient Space launch, and so and then Astrobotic also uh, launched with the Vulcan rocket, right? So. I would say that going forward, uh, 2024 might actually exceed 2023. Well, and again, it doesn't always get the headlines, I think, but these launches just continue to move forward and increase. And I was surprised when I read that, you know, that, I mean, for the third year in a row. Uh, so out of the 10 major types of rockets that were used in 2023, nearly half of all launches appear to be with the reusable SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket. And if I understand correctly, the majority of launches are also used for commercial satellites, which shouldn't surprise anyone. Uh, does this put SpaceX in the pole position for commercial space deployment? And do you think that they will remain there in 2024? So if you look at 2024, they might remain there uh, because of the fact that they're already established in the system. Uh, we do have Blue Origin that will attempt to launch the new Glenn rocket, uh, their version of a uh, orbital uh, launch system. Uh, they, that has been delayed since 2020. But then going forward, I think SpaceX will face uh, competition, which is good for the launch industry. So you have Rocket Lab that is talking about building their own reusable rocket with the Neutron rocket, uh, which in the words of Rocket Lab CEO, they want to launch it with about 50 million per launch, which is a direct competition with the Falcon 9, which cost about 67 million to get to low Earth orbit. And they're hoping that they would be able to use it for 20 launches a year. And then you have, uh, I think, Stoke Space, which actually comes from your state of Washington, from Kent. They're developing their own reusable rocket. They just tested last December uh, their uh, one a stage that in which they uh, sent it up to about uh, 30 meters uh, and then came back. And so that's there. And then you, of course, have China's iSpace that also tested their uh, Hyperbola 2, which went to about 50 meters and came down. So going forward with all these companies investing in reusable rockets, if not 2024, but by 2026, uh, SpaceX will face competition. So SpaceX needs to stay on their toes. And they actually are. On November 18th, they performed the second integrated new orbital flight of the Starship rocket. And from what I understand, they're working on an even larger version of this monster that will be arriving soon and has been dubbed Starship 2. Uh, you know, over the past few years, I have seen so many of these things blow up on the pad that I quit paying close attention to it. But it appears that they are continuing to make big strides forward with it, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So 
for example, the test that you mentioned, uh, one thing that was very uh, actually quite successful, while the test itself appeared to be failed, uh, they were able to ignite all their 33 Raptor engines. They were able to do hot stage separation. Uh, and so those itself can count for a success story. And we'll see more uh, tests uh, going forward. So yeah, that's actually quite an interesting and exciting development given the fact that Starship promises to lift about 140 metric tons to low Earth orbit. So that's going to change the game of space uh, to a large extent. Well, that leads into what yourself and your co-author, uh, Dr. Peter Gerritsen, have written about in Scramble for the Skies. You talked about the emerging space economy, where things are going, and you've outlined some general timelines as well. And I'm going to put a link in the show notes to Scramble for the Skies, which is an amazing book, and that was truly a labor of love for both of you. So I want people to go in there and take a look on that. Now, I want to get back into... Um, let me see, a New York Times article, which reported that Elon Musk said SpaceX could land a spacecraft on Mars three to four years from now. This goes back to Starship and then Starship 2. He is projecting maybe around 2028, I think, if those numbers work right. I'm wondering if that revised schedule sounds feasible, because they do keep pushing that back. I believe it was originally 2024, now it's 2028. And again, you've mentioned competition in uh, the, you know, the launch industry. Do you think he'll have any competition in his bid to land the first human on Mars? That's a very, very ambitious plan, right? By 2028, that's four years from now. So while uh, we cannot save its technology, right? Whether someone can actually achieve it. But from what I'm seeing, uh, I would think 2028 uh, is highly unlikely. And so I'll say that because of the fact that you first have to get the Starship working, then you have to build that entire ecosystem. And then in, in comparison, if you look at the timelines that have been put out by NASA, for example, the early 2030s, where they hope to achieve a human landing on Mars. And then China came up with a much more specific date, which is uh, 2033, where they hope to achieve human landing on Mars. So if uh, SpaceX can do it, uh, in 2028, that's going to be a major achievement for humanity. Uh, I see it as unlikely, but uh, technology can always surprise us. So, well, we're going to Mars, though, one way or another, right? <laughs> yes. And so, yeah. I want to I want to touch on NASA's Artemis program as well. And I went back to Wikipedia for this. They've been updating that regularly. The crewed Artemis II launch will take place in late 2025. The Artemis III crewed lunar landing in 2026, Artemis IV docking with the Lunar Gateway in 2028, and there will be future yearly landings on the moon thereafter. That's, that's what they have projected, at least. So from what I understand, they're not making progress on this as fast as they'd like to, but they've at least started test launches, and they do have a plan in place, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, in a sense, uh, this has been happening with Artemis from the time it was announced, right, that they have been shifting their timelines uh, almost every year. And as you said, just I think yesterday, NASA administrator tweeted, and then we saw the press conference where they said that they're going to have Artemis 2 in September of 2025, and Artemis 3, I think, in September of 2026. So, while they have as you said, tested, for example, the space launch system, the fact that they are continuously delaying their human spaceflight program means that they might delay it even further uh, in terms of whether they can meet the 2025 deadline that's up in the air. And I say this because of the fact that, uh, if not directly related, but somehow related, is the fact that uh, Astrobotic, which launched uh, Peregrine 1, uh, also had issues with its uh, propulsion system under the NASA Commercial Lunar Payload Service uh, and would not become, I was hoping it would, but would not become the first uh, global commercial company to land on the moon, right? So you see this with space that unless you test capability, you are actually able to demonstrate that you have the ability to land humans and safety is a big issue. Uh, my concern is that that timeline might be even more delayed. And this comes at a very interesting geopolitical time because unlike NASA missions, 
the China National Space Administration just announced on the same day that they are going to go ahead on schedule for their Chang'e 6 Lunar South Pole Sample Return Mission. And so we are, we ha we are in an era where timelines really matter. Well, and I want to come back and touch on China in a moment. Um, in terms of Artemis, though, CNBC reported that NASA's Artemis effort has been delayed for years with the program running billions over budget, which probably shouldn't be a surprise to people who follow NASA. Uh, NASA has spent more than $42 billion since 2012 to develop and build the systems behind this program, with the agency's inspector general noting that the initial missions will cost $4.2 billion per launch. That part surprised me when I read it. That's a lot of, that's a lot of dough. So it, it sounds like this thing is... I mean, obviously, we're talking about a moonshot here, but is this sustainable? I mean, I, I've heard people say that maybe we should look at using SpaceX or something along those lines, just from the savings that would come with that. Yeah, and Starship is seen as such a capability, right? And so that's why there is so much uh, behind and so much uh, hope that it'll succeed as a platform. And so, yeah, if you look at the Inspector General's assessment of Artemis uh, and also the overall budget of the program, it's about $94 billion. That's a very high tax bill. And yeah. so when you, when you think about sustainable missions, the idea is that you are this time going to moon, not just as we all know, for a very limited human landing. You're thinking about permanent a uh, settlement on the moon, right? Or a permanent research station on the moon and viewing the moon as a pit stop, especially with the NASA program to get to Mars. If it is going to be this expensive just to build this logistics ecosystem, the program to Mars is going to exceed a lot in terms of its budget and what it is uh, given, right? And so I don't think this is sustainable in the long run. Uh, the fact that they're going billions over budget, the fact that they're getting delayed, uh, a recent report by the Inspector General pointed out that NASA did not have clear idea of the supply chain, for example, for Artemis. So where are the contractors and contractors that contract to the contractors? Where are they in the supply chain mechanism? So all these are very serious issues. Uh, whether uh, NASA agreed to some of the recommendations as to how they can build a system that is uh, much more efficient in terms of uh, building that map of its supply chain mechanism for Artemis. But then again, we have a delay. So, uh, and such an expensive program, uh, I'm concerned that this is not going to be sustainable in the long run. I, I certainly hope that they're able to find a way to get there. And as you mentioned, human colonization would be so tremendous. I mean, the moon has helium-3. Um, it has what looks like resources for water as well as oxygen and hydrogen to make rocket fuel, right? And that gives us access to the asteroids for mining. I've been watching the, uh, For All Mankind, the, the Apple TV series, and the commercial opportunities are tremendous. So I think anybody who follows this should be excited about it. It's more about how we can make that work, right, as a society. But uh, so I want to touch on some of the other programs. You mentioned China a moment ago. China, India, and Russia are also making great strides in the emerging space economy. Um, can you give me kind of a brief overview of what's going on with those nations? Yeah, absolutely. So let's start with India. So last year, of course, India's mission, the Chandrayaan-3, was such a success, right, uh, in terms of landing on the southern hemisphere of the moon. And also the fact that it was done in such a cost-effective manner. We've been talking about this nonstop since it landed, that the price was about $75 million, which included the rocket, the lander, the rover, which is a very uh, cost-effective way. And then I think what is interesting is that India, for the first time, has issued a vision, which it calls the India Space Vision 2047, which is the 100-year celebration of India becoming independent from British colonial rule in 1947. And as part of that space vision, India is talking about building lunar habitation, uh, building uh, a capability to send humans to the moon by 2040 with its own a launch capability and system, which includes human life support. And then what is interesting, Tim, as you mentioned, uh, which we also 
a kind of forecast and project in our book, Scramble for the Skies, that India is talking about space mining and lunar resource utilization as part of its vision, which is an amazing development for India and a change from its traditional goals of looking at space just from a satellite communication navigation perspective, a support to Earth uh, architecture. In terms of China's space program, so if you look at the lunar program of China, they are, as I mentioned before, they are going to the south pole of the moon. The south pole Aitken Basin is where they are planning to land with their Chang'e 6 mission, which is a sample return mission of, uh, of samples from the lunar south pole the first time for humanity, if that successfully is accomplished. And then they have many, many subsequent missions to about 2036, where they are going to send the Chang'e 7, the Chang'e 8 to study the surface of the South Pole. And then in collaboration with Russia, the country you mentioned, they want to establish a research station by 2036. And then, interestingly, very similar to India, China has also announced a human mission to the moon by 2030. So 10 years before India. Of course, India has said 2040. Now, in terms of Russia, uh, Russia, of course, suffered a failure last year with the Luna 25 when it crashed and it lost communication and the propulsion system didn't work. Uh, but they still have the Luna 26, the 27. And in collaboration with China, they also want to contribute to not just the entire cislunar ecosystem, but also to develop lunar scientific capability. I'll end by saying that your viewers, if they're interested, they should go to the website of the China National Space Administration, especially the page which is called the International Lunar Research Station. You would think mm. that this uh, data is from 2021, but actually they've updated their data on that page this year and last year. And now they are talking about the entire process of how they're going to establish the cislunar ecosystem, the entire the science, the human technological sustainable capability, and the space resource utilization capability. This is so exciting. It, this is tremendous, right? I mean, for everyone who grew up dreaming about space, this is happening, and it's happening right now. So let me touch on, I guess, the X factor here, which are international tensions that could potentially cause some issues, especially in the international aspect of this. Um, there are tensions between the United States and Russia over the Ukraine war and with China over Taiwan. Now, do you think that these will impact either of their space programs or satellite deployments, I mean, especially when it comes to those supply chains, right? Because so many components are American made when it comes to space. Um, I know that there are some embargoes in place, and there's also a decoupling between the United States and China, and I think potentially supply chain disruptions going back to COVID as well, right? So do you think that may impact any of these space deployments or launches? So that's a very strategic question, because uh, I think we discussed this earlier with you as well, in case Taiwan if China takes over Taiwan, what happens to the semiconductor industry, for example, right? And the supply chain mechanism, which is absolutely vital for the world. And so in terms of the conflict in Ukraine, uh, the sanctions you mentioned that are placed on Russia, and then China doesn't have the kind of sanction, but uh, in case there is a conflict in Taiwan, uh, there, would their space industry be affected? So what is uh, interesting is that Russia basically made a lot of uh, actually official statements when the U.S. sanctioned Russia over uh, its Ukraine invasion uh, in February 2022, that that kind of sanction could have an impact on Russian space capability and technology, in fact, to support the International Space Station, right? So they made that very clear in terms of their official response. So in a sense, Russia might uh, suffer from a lack of scientific uh, supply chain mechanism if if there is a further escalation of conflict, say, or it continues to have this very prolonged conflict in Ukraine. I think China is learning lessons from that, watching Russia. And so what China has done in the last few years since the Ukraine conflict and even before is that they are starting to build their innovation base and their manufacturing base, especially for high-end technology, indigenously. So they have the China innovation policy and the China made in made in China 2025 policy, which is included as part of their uh, 14th five year plan. 
2021 to 2025, in which they highlight that the most important priority for China is to be able to manufacture domestically very key supply chain, especially for their robotics, artificial intelligence, quantum and space. So they are anticipating a very similar scenario in case there is an escalation of conflict in Taiwan, and they are starting to uh, build capability to meet that particular eventuality. Whether they succeed, we don't know. We do know that China leads in terms of manufacturing in several other sectors, including solar panels, rare earth minerals. They are the leaders in the world. So they do have certain advantages. And so we'll have to wait and see. But they, they are starting to think about that particular scenario in the long run. Ah, well, I appreciate you sharing that. The reason that I asked that question was I saw an infographic on LinkedIn actually last week, and they had talked about Russian-made weapons. And I guess someone had taken, I believe it was a drone, and they had taken it apart and looked at where all the components came from. And if I remember correctly, in this particular case, something like 45% of the components in this were American-made. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm guessing a lot of those may have been manufactured in China, but they were at least American-made components, right? They were American companies that owned them. And so it occurred to me that if these escalations do continue, you know, those supply chains for American-made components might tighten up. Yeah, I mean, that's a great, uh, I haven't seen this infographic that you're mentioning, but if that's the case, uh, there there would be issues which you mentioned, right? So I'll, I'll respond to that by also saying that if you watch the conflict that is unfolding, since we're talking about conflicts and space uh, support or satellite imagery. If you look at the conflict that is unfolding between Israel and Hamas, uh, what is the most insightful uh, fact in terms of how technology is playing a role is that almost all the drones that Hamas use, as you know, Hamas improvised with drones, including swarm of drones that attack Israeli observation towers, which Israel had placed in its 40 mile long in border, right, with Hamas built at a cost of, I think, $1.4 billion. So what Hamas did was that they sent these drones, but these are all off the shelf commercial drones that use satellite imagery. And so, and the Houthis are doing a very similar activity. So now, as you said, where these components are made, it's basically assumed that these are commercial self drones, uh, off the shelf drones, beg your pardon. And so now, if supply chain mechanisms come in, and as if you break open those drones apart, are they Chinese made? Many of them are, uh, and and basically found in the commercial market. But if they are American owned, that would also raise legal issues, right? And so, yeah. So I think it's a very interesting uh, point that you put forward. Complex, complex, very complex issues. Yeah, and some mysteries as well. I have an interesting one here. Space.com recently reported that just four days after being launched on its third mission, China's mysterious reusable space plane seems to have placed six unknown objects into orbit, and some of those appear to be transmitting. So I, I wanted to ask if you have any thoughts on what might be happening here. A great question, because uh, Peter and I are, are just uh, put out a I think it's going to get published very soon on what are the strategic implications of the Chinese space plane. So I'll share that with you when it comes out. But I think for your audience, uh, what is very critical in terms of China's military space plane capability is that they argue that is, of course, a testing of reusable technology. And this is the third time they have tested the plane. Right. And so one thing that space planes can do is that they can hide what they have inside them. You do not know because till the door is open, you really don't know what the capability is, what those satellites are doing. Uh, and the other thing which is interesting about space planes is that if you launch more of them, it is very difficult then to be able to predict their flight path, unlike a satellite, right? So these are the military implications of space planes. And then finally, space planes can also, if they want, come very close to another country's satellite or any kind of space asset. And in case, and this is the thing, because you do not know what is inside them, they might have a robotic arm that can grab your an adversary satellite or damage an adversary satellite. So 
uh, space planes are absolutely something to watch. And since China is developing this capability, uh, something that would add to its dual use space assets as well. So this is all so interesting. And so one of the things that I'd wondered about was last year, the U.S. shot down the Chinese spy balloon after it transited the country. I think everybody remembers that. And then when they went back and looked, it appears that there had been several previous spy balloons. And so they changed their radar parameter settings to detect those. And I guess the DOD is just more carefully scrutinizing American airspace now. But I had wondered if the spinoff of this might have gone to what those six unknown objects are. You know, could China and potentially Russia as well be looking at space-based alternatives, right? Satellites or microsatellites for surveillance instead of things like spy balloons because we have made that off limits to them. So if you look at China and Russia's strategy, um, they would not look at space as an alternative by itself. It will be the building of an entire ecosystem that builds into their intelligence, reconnaissance, surveillance, targeting capability, right? So while, as you said, the DOD is now focused on any infringement on airspace, that does not mean that they will not continue to use such capability. China has just established a hypersonic command uh, so basically using hypersonic capability, uh, which again is very difficult because of its speed and also its ability to glide. So you might not be able to predict what they're doing. And Russia, as you know, is also invested in that capability. China is far ahead though. So I would say that uh, while they would cumulatively use their space capability to build that map of what an adversary country is doing, they would not look at something as a single source or alternative. And I'll give this, I'll give a, a, a metaphor or an example for this, right? So one thing that China is really investing in is to diversify its launch systems, right? So while the U.S. is very much focused on liquid propel uh, reusable rockets, uh, China is actually focusing on building a diverse platform of rockets, including solid propel, the one that just launched uh, by China's commercial company called Orion Space. It was a solid propelled rocket. China claims it's the rocket with the highest cap capacity launched from a sea-based platform of six tons to lower Earth orbit, 6.5 tons that beats uh, India's uh, Mark III, which has about six tons to lower Earth orbit. Uh, and so, uh, so solid propel, they're also focusing on methane propel, kerosene propel, and also liquid propel. So very similarly, and they call it tactically responsive launch platform. So in case there is a satellite that's damaged, they can immediately replace it, right? They don't have to wait for the cumbersome liquid propel rocket that requires a lot of infrastructure and maintenance. Solid propel can be launched from a sea-based platform. And so similarly, to answer your question in short, in, in, in terms of uh, ISR, intelligence, reconnaissance, and surveillance, they would use a diversified uh, variety of platforms also to kind of uh, blind the enemy because they're using so many platforms that you are looking at balloons, but you're not looking at hypersonic capability, right? Balloons yeah. are, <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, it's, it, I, there is so much going on. And going beyond satellites, uh, last year, Last August, China's U-2 rover reportedly discovered a network of hidden passages under the surface of the dark side of the moon. Now, you had touched on this, I think, a few moments ago. You know, so China is, is pushing forward, right, to the moon and eventually Mars. And in this case, it raises the question of whether China is pulling ahead of the U.S. in terms of lunar exploration. And what my mind immediately went to was the use of lava tubes as future locations for underground colonization, right? Because they offer radiation protection, and they're basically natural cavities that can be reinforced and pressurized um, so that it reduces cost. I mean, there are all sorts of potential advantages to doing that. Um, do you think that that's something that they may be in the plans of? And I'm, I'm also wondering if we are ahead on Mars, but lagging in the moon. So I would say that if you, the, to answer your question about lava tubes and what uh, the far side mission found, right? And looking into the dark side or far side of the moon. So uh, I have heard Chinese scientists talk about the critical 
uh, protection that lava tubes offer in case you want to have a settlement on the moon. In terms of their official space policy, they're looking more at building actual structures, habitation structures mm. that have life regenerative systems, including oxygen usage, uh, water ice usage. So that's the official version. But what is interesting in China's space policy and including human settlement on the moon is that they do look at, as I mentioned earlier, uh, several different technologies. They are very much tuned into the concept of lava tubes. So I would not be surprised in the next few years if China's major scientists behind their lunar program, like Wu Weirin, will start talking about that as well, right? Because I think they're waiting to see if they can do it. Once they prove it by simulation, experimentation on Earth that this is feasible, then they put it out as an official document. Now, in terms of are they ahead uh, in regard to their lunar program, yes, they are. So, I mean, if you look at where the US is today and where China is, China has already landed more than three missions on the moon. Uh, they have the Chang'e 3, the Chang'e 4, the Chang'e 5, their lunar sample return mission. And then they are actually uh, launching on time their Chang'e 6 mission. And this is incredible because all these missions that they are actually meeting their timeline were announced about 10 years ago. How do they do it is a real puzzle to me sometimes, you know, that they actually meet their uh, timelines. I think it's because they have simulated for several years those missions. They are very aware that if you do not meet a particular timeline, you get delayed several years. So meet it if possible. And the, and the other thing which it tells me is that their confidence level is really increasing. And so and so that's a very interesting uh fact about the Chinese program. Now, in regard to Mars, what I see is that while NASA has announced that they would want to achieve human missions to Mars in the 2030s, they have not put out a clear date. And this worries me, because if you say 2030s, it could be 2039, right? China has actually put out a specific year. 2033. And based on my research, when I see that they put out years, for example, their lunar missions, their Tiangong space station, uh, their relay satellites that they launch, uh, they're going to launch another one uh, in a few months, uh, their Mars mission, they had put those years about 10 years ago, and they've met those timelines, right? Now they're saying that they're going to have human landing on Mars by 2033, specific date. If they do it, and if SpaceX does not succeed in 2028, they will be ahead of NASA because NASA has not announced a specific date as yet. Well, the race is on. And again, yeah. that goes right to the title of your book, Scramble for the Skies. And I want to remind people to pick up a copy of that because yourself and Peter Gerritsen have outlined a roadmap for where this is all going. And it's brilliant work. So, Namrata, thank you so much. It is always a pleasure and truly an honor to have you with me again today. Let me close by asking, what do you expect to be making the biggest headlines in space as we move further into 2024? What should we be keeping our eyes open for in the first few months of the year, do you think? I think it is going to be Asia's year to shine. <laughs> I say that because when I look at 2024, one of my colleagues on LinkedIn put it very well. It's like a space opera unfolding, right? So uh, China is going with the lunar sample mission. That's going to be dramatic if it succeeds, because again, for the first time, I remember the excitement of the world when the Chang'e 4 landed on the far side of the moon for the first time. So that's going to dominate the news. And then India has announced that they plan to, in collaboration with Japan, do a very similar kind of mission uh, to the moon's South Pole to hunt for water ice. Now, if that succeeds, that's going to be a big deal. I'll finally end by saying that uh, while Astrobotic is planning another mission uh, to the South Pole uh, in this year, and if Blue Origin succeeds with uh, New Glenn, that's going to be big. The mission that people have not talked about is Japan's mission. It's landing on January 19th if it successfully does that. It means that Japan will demonstrate a smart landing technology for investigating the moon, which they call the pinpoint technology. So basically, till today, we have landed where we think it is safe, which includes 
tens of kilometers, right? So it's not really where we want to land. We land where we think it is safe to land. So Japan is trying to prove to the world that if we want to, if we are really serious about mining and exploiting space resources, there are very few areas on the moon that has it in, in large numbers, but we have to be very precise. We need to have a landing technology that can land within 100 meters of where it wants to land. So if SLIM succeeds on January 19 to demonstrate that, that's going to catch the imagination of the space community. Because going forward, uh, they will be able to collaborate with other nations, including the Artemis Accord signatories, of which Japan and India are members, uh, to forward uh, the US-initiated uh, uh, plan for the moon. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you again so much for your time today, ma'am. Uh, thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure.